This is Tatiana Prophet, Editor-in-Chief of the online magazine Back to Facts, your moderator for the upcoming exclusive interview. Actress Catherine Oxenberg is our welcomed guest today. She is interviewed by Dr. Kathleen Mann about her crusade to save her daughter India from the cult known as Nexium. Her book Captive was released earlier this month and is already number 24 on Amazon's books about religion. In 2011, Oxenberg saw an opportunity to bond with her then 20-year-old daughter after she learned from a friend about a self-improvement program called Nexium. She and India attended the meeting and her nightmare began. For nearly 20 years, thousands of people have paid as much as $3,400 for an executive coaching workshop offered by the Albany, New York-based organization whose leader, Keith Renier, 57, is known as Vanguard to his followers. With locations in New York, San Francisco, and Mexico, the group claims to take people on a journey of personal discovery and development. In her book, Oxenberg discusses her harrowing experience with this cult in detail. Dr. Kathleen Mann, a court-qualified cult expert, addresses family dynamics when they are complicated by membership in a cult as immersive as Nexium. Dr. Mann addresses the major topics in the book, such as the early stages of deception, all the way to the shocking revelations about deviant behavior in the cult, including the horrific branding and the victimization of women as slaves of the leader. This interview is presented to take the conversation further than most discussions of cults, to shed light on how and why cults work, and how Catherine Oxenberg's fearless devotion saved her daughter. Catherine Oxenberg is an American actress whose best remembered role was as Amanda Carrington on the primetime soap Dynasty. Other significant roles were her portrayal of Princess Diana in the royal romance of Charles and Diana. She is the daughter of Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia. We now present this interview with Catherine Oxenberg and Dr. Kathleen Mann. So how are you? It's so, such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Oh, the feeling is mutual. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I'm doing much better. Thank you. This has been a very stressful year for me. Yes, I imagine. I, I, I read your book, um, and I wish you could have been here while I was reading it so I could have asked you some questions along the way. Um, and there were a few surprises, mm -hmm. uh, a few surprises in the book, uh, things I didn't expect, but um, I thought that in general you did a very good job of explaining how, how much torture it is for a parent to see a, their adult child going through something like this. Yeah, um, thank you. I also wanted to, one of the things that really struck me was you did a pretty good job of explaining how terrible it is to be a cult member. I think that people forget that, certainly the media forgets it. They forget that being a cult member is hard, it's boring, it's stressful, it's full of fear, and the pressure is enormous. And mm -hmm. So people think that cult members are having a good time. They're definitely not. I'm glad I got that across. Thank you. You did. You did. And um, the fact that she had to hide so much from you, is, you know, certainly was a bad sign. Mm-hmm. What do you think that her motivation was? To, do you think it was to avoid criticism, or do you think she was not aware? Or do you think that maybe she didn't realize? She didn't, what do you think, that she didn't realize that she was hiding stuff from me? No, that she didn't realize the extent of, of what she was in. Oh, yeah. I think from what I'm getting now, because what I'm finding fascinating is it's as if her memory is coming back. And I think that possibly the indoctrination causes a certain degree of compartmentalizing and obviously normalizing of inappropriate behaviors. Um, and now that she's healing and her psyche is not as fractured, she is remembering things and is shocked that she forgot things. So I don't think she was necessarily consciously hiding. I mean, you know way more about cults than I do and, how, and the behavior. So, 
you know, I prefer to defer to you in terms of motivation. <laughs> well, it's um, kind of complicated. I'm a lay person. Mm -hmm. It's kind of complicated to explain, but basically it, it involves the fact that there's no time for introspection. So they're so busy um, doing things and being over-involved and activities and exercises and reading and um, that, you know, like most of us, we have downtime during the day where we just think about things that happen to us. So basically, it's the over-involvement and the you, you sleep, you, you eat, and you read, and you practice the activity all the time, and you don't have any time to think about anything else. Yeah. I mean, that's very um, deliberate on the part. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Is she, um, and a lot of it too is they're afraid of the reaction they're going to get if they share something. Uh, we, there was, there was mean, a lot of that in your book. Oh, that she's afraid, that, of people being afraid to share information with people? I think she was afraid to tell you too much about what was happening because she was trying to protect you. Oh, that's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that. She wasn't trying to protect herself. She was trying to protect how she was being perceived. And since her primary attachment was to you, she was afraid of it, how it might hurt you, I think. Yeah. That makes sense. But you, you shouldn't blame yourself for that. That's just something that... I think she probably knew instinctively. Yeah, but plus they're getting reinforcements and that they're sworn to secrecy. And then that their masters are going to be punished if they do share. I mean, there's all these layers of guilt and coercion and control. So it makes it impossible to have a relationship and communicate with anybody outside of the group. Which is, which is intentional. I mean, if you think about it just in context, um, these these cult groups like Nexium mm -hmm. and me, you know, the other hundreds of cult groups that all do the same thing, mm -hmm. um, they do it because they know that no one would affiliate with them if they knew up front what they were really going to experience. Mm -hmm. They know that mm -hmm. they have to lie in order to get people to affiliate um, and to me that's always the most disturbing thing if they can't be honest about who they are and what they do and what the what the sacrifices are then to me that makes the group very suspicious yeah but how do you find out if there's that level of deception how do you find good out? Question. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, because all successful cult groups practice deception. Correct. They, they have to. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just a one-time thing. They do it during the course of the involvement. So they, they don't ever start telling the truth all of a sudden. And what even? How do go ahead? No, please. Go ahead, no, please. no, you. No, 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 no. Tell me what happened. <laughs> well, and what happens is that as they rise up in level, or as they gain inner awareness, and they start to see the hypocrisy, um, they've usually been part of the deception either through recruiting people through deception or in this particular group, Nexium, through the practice of, of their, well, I call them confession letters. I mean, they all, they all do, all groups do the same type of thing and call them something different. Mm -hmm. So the point is, is by the time they rise enough in level to where they know anything, they're then part of the hypocrisy 
a part of the deception. So that makes it much more difficult to to leave or get out. So it's Do a they? deliberate grooming process. It's a deliberate grooming process. Gosh, yes. How does how do you stop that? You, even if, because I've seen people who come out of this cult who are very high level, and how do I mean? How do you stop doing that behavior? Well, there's a couple of ways that that the behavior will backfire. One is that if you don't prepare someone adequately, if they rise up in level too quickly, and they're not indoctrinated enough and they see too much inner truth too quickly mm. that, that that can cause a break um, secondly is if the hypocrisy or the abuse is done to them as opposed to them seeing it done to other people it becomes a lot more personal and a lot easier to break but most people age out of cults. They they leave after a certain period of time because they are all out of energy, I always call it, the stamina problem. The, the vast majority of cult members leave on their own because they have no stamina. That makes sense. However, with this cult, um, there were, I saw, I mean, that was one of the things before I understood it was a cult. There were people who just never left. Right, but they were high-ranking people that never yes. left. Yes. Right, yes. that's the key difference. I mean, let's talk about Nancy Saltzman. Okay. Um, the reason why she stayed so long is because she was given a tremendous amount of power. Mm -hmm. And she obviously liked that. Uh, relished it, enjoyed it, and so she would have had to give it up. And, you know, there's a lot of rationalization that goes on. Somebody asked me a question yesterday. I was doing an interview, and they asked me specifically about Nancy, if I considered her, what I thought of her. You know, was she a bad person? And... I, I don't understand enough about human psychology to know if people are thought of bad or if they're groomed into becoming bad or, um, I don't know. I just thought this is a woman that perhaps had good intentions in the beginning, but how do people become corrupted like this, that they lose all conscience? Well, I don't really think it's a question of conscience as much as it is a question of adaptation or adapting. Mm -hmm. I think that something could be said for compensatory narcissism, which is narcissism that comes out of being put in a power pos powerful position for a long period of time it may cause you to become narcissistic. You learn mm -hmm. the behavior. You learn the behavior. You may not have started out being narcissistic, but you learn the behavior. And part of it is a function in order to survive in the system, but a mm -hmm. lot of it is because they enjoy it. Oh, I, well, what you're describing fits Allison Mass as well to a T. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it's not an excuse for them, but they really don't have any awareness and that's the thing that I think I find the most frustrating when dealing with family members who have a cult member in their family if they think that they're doing it deliberately somehow. I try to explain that all of this is out of their awareness. They're, they're mm -hmm. not aware that they're being indoctrinated. They're not mm -hmm. aware that this is a cult. I mean, when I, when I talk to current cult members, which I do a lot of, you have to have a special way to talk to them. And one of the ways you do it is by asking them to give you an example of what a cult is, since they certainly must not be in one. Can you give me an example of what a cult is? 
And most of the time they can't tell you. And then I say, well, would you like to know what the characteristics of cults are? Sometimes they mm-hmm. don't listen and sometimes they won't. But for me to measure the level of indoctrination comes from how well they're able to define a cult and, and to see it objectively. 99% of the time they can't do that. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Your comment about people aren't aware that, being, that they're being indoctrinated. Um, what about somebody like Akif Raniere? Was he aware every step of the way of what he was doing? I think he was aware of it, but, you know, in a, diff- if a different way than the average person. I mean, he became what he is because of trial and error. Um, because the way I look at it is, you can kind of tell the motivations of people, and you can interpret their behavior based on how they behave when someone confronts them or challenges them. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they're if they're really who they say they are, and they're really this special person, um, and they have all these special abilities, why are they so defensive? Why are they hiding? Why are they going through all these extraordinary things to get people to follow them? Mm-hmm. It, and, you know, they never have a good answer. So, I don't know, I haven't evaluated Keith Raniere. I haven't mm-hmm. psychologically evaluated him, but I can tell by his behavior and his defensiveness, and the fact that he likes to silence critics, mm-hmm. that he feels like there's something worthy of hiding because honest people don't act like that. Mm-hmm. Open groups do not act like Nexium. Yeah. Honest people don't act like Keith Ranieri. Um, and honest people are willing to take you on your own terms without trying to change you into a mold of something they want you to be. Mm -hmm. So that's not very complicated psychologically, but it's really, if you're you're a legitimate spiritual leader, you're a legitimate teacher, you need to show me what you've done to earn that and why I should trust you, not the other way around. Yes, got it. Do you think that he was born like this, with hmm. this inclination? Oh, I don't know. Okay. It, psychology doesn't know enough about it to be able to, to say that, and, and I don't know what he would be born with. I mean, when we we talk about the behavior of um, people who are criminal or antisocial or uh, narcissistic, it's really hard to determine the cause of that. Uh, psychology is able to look backwards and say, mm-hmm. oh, we have this criminal now. We can look backwards and say, these are the events that probably led to that. But we're not very good at predicting things. Yeah, that's true. I'm just, you know, I'm fascinated. I mean, I think he's a psychopath. And I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of that they do psychological profiling on whether it's serial killers or people who have these types of mental pathology, what, um, what makes them the way I'm fascinated, why, why, I mean, he, the way he thinks is very different than me or any normal person, and his desire for power and control is, seems a little excessive, um, it's fascinating to me, and that he could do this much damage and destruction under the guise well. of somebody who's affecting people. I'm not trying to defend him, but he doesn't think that's what he's doing. Oh, Um, okay, so what does he think he's doing? Well, you know, we don't really use the word psychopath anymore. I mean, and part of the reason why is because it's a a term that really has no clear definition. But we do use the term uh, antisocial or say that someone has, uh, you know, some pretty narcissistic 
qualities. Um, and you've got to understand that from their point of view, they, they see themselves as so special that they don't have to follow the rules that everybody else has to follow, number one. And okay. two, they engage in a lot of rationalization and it becomes a habit. But mm. I do think there are just people that are, um, I don't like to use the word evil because it's not a psychological term, but I do mm. like the word the fact, use the fact that they are bad actors and they, mm -hmm. they are much more focused on their needs and what they want and as time goes on they get worse and worse and worse. Mm. And they, you know, like Keith Raniere erects all of these processes to protect himself, to um, make himself fit his image of being special. Yeah. And he's been doing it a very, very long time. And so at this point, like most long-term cult leaders, He's not in touch with reality. Mm. Yeah, I see that. I see that. With, I saw that with my daughter. So well, sure. you know, it's it's interesting that that with your daughter, you know, the descriptions of her and her personality and her qualities are just just perfect for someone like Keith Raniere who is very predatory. Yeah. But again, it's hard for them to know. It's hard to see it when it's happening to you. It's, it's mm -hmm. hard to see indoctrination when it's happening. You may feel like something is off or odd, but you don't really, you can't really put your finger on it. Yeah, I, use, I can attack that. use classic that. indoctrination techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, does that help in, in terms of understanding someone like Keith? Because he really is a very, he really is not that special. What, what he does is not that special. He's typical of the many cult leaders I've had to deal with over the years. Yeah, that's what I've been told. But, and. And it's really a lot of fun to try to interview them. Um, Why? <laughs> well, because they're so easily offended. It's, you know, I've interviewed lots of cult leaders, and the number one thing for them is always that I have to be careful how I talk to them. How do I address them? That is the most important thing to them. You know, that they have to be called a certain title. So why would that be the most important thing in the world during an interview? I would think the most important thing is to show me your truth. But they're, they're all wrapped up in titles and how they're perceived and how they're talked to and your tone and your manner and all of these things that show how fragile they really are. Why do they give you access to them? Well, because they're smarter than I am, and because I'm so wrong that they just think it's going to be really easy to show me how wrong I am, and so I'm I'm all I'm willing to do that. But I do have some rules mm -hmm. about talking to cult leaders. Like I limit the title, whatever title they want to be called, I limit mm -hmm. it to two words. Like I had a, had a situation where he wanted me to call him master of the universe. I said, no, I only have a, I have a two word limit. <laughs> Why do you do that? That's so funny. Because it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm not going to call somebody um, something as outrageous as that. I prefer just to call them by their last name, Mr. or Mrs. or whatever. Just call them by their right mm -hmm. name rather than the title. But that's a big deal. So we have to negotiate before we ever start talking how I address them, you know. And I'm told how to watch my tone and mm -hmm. that I'm not, not allowed to say certain things. And I'm like, well, you know, this is an interview. And I pretty much am going to say whatever I want to say. So 
let the kids go away. But they, they, but they do it because it's an act of dominance and superiority. Mm. So, more than, more, they're more than happy to talk to me when I'm working, working on a case or I'm working on an investigation. Um, I always offer them the opportunity to talk to me, and most of the time they do. I've been turned down a couple of times, but most of the time. Um, they want to show me how stupid and dumb I really am. Do you always, um, what do I want to ask you about that? Oh, so if you were um, an expert witness for this particular case, what are some of the things that you think the prosecution should stress? Well, I mean, I think that they have already more than enough evidence of several criminal behavior, criminal acts. Um, you know, this isn't the first time that I've been, been asked about legal issues concerning next him and Ranieri, and I just think that they're so flagrant. Um, the, the problem comes when ex-members um, testify. A lot of the time, they're not treated very well by the prosecution. Mm -hmm. So that's usually the only spot where I try to work with ex-members and, and help them understand what to expect. And the other problem is that 99% of people in the world don't have any idea what a cult is. Yeah. They think it has something to do with wacky beliefs. It has nothing to do with their beliefs. It has to do with their practices and their criminal enterprises. So that's always a big hurdle trying to educate lawyers. Uh, how do you just, what would be a simple description when you're trying to educate somebody? Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Well, when you're saying most of the world doesn't know what cults are, how do you just, how do you, um, how do you explain that to people? Because I, well, I definitely, it's difficult. I mean, you, all you can do is, give as many media stories as you can, uh, talk to people um, whenever you get the opportunity, but it's a, it's a huge problem. And even on some of the shows that have done a good job of exposing these cults, a lot of people think, oh, let's, and I get, I get this from media that call me they say, well, let's talk about their, their weird beliefs. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, their beliefs are not my focus. Mm -hmm. every, every group that you look at as an outsider has weird beliefs. Let's talk about their practices. Let's talk about how they recruit, how they mm -hmm. retain, mm -hmm. how they fight critics, how they handle dissent, um, mm -hmm. and what criminal activities they're involved in. Let's talk about that. So. And how come a group like this can, has been able to, how come these groups, I mean, besides the ones that are under sort of religious protection, how are these groups able to go under the radar for so long and avoid prosecution for such blatant criminal practices? Well, that's a good question. I think um, there were several factors involved, probably the corruption of the local government, mm -hmm. uh, probably um, people unwilling or afraid to speak out. Um, and I don't think that there are any cult groups that I know of that have religious protection. Now, they may have religious protection for their beliefs, but they certainly don't have religious pr protection for their practices. You can't well, do well, what whatever you want to do. Well, how come no one's crossing, I mean, how come Scientology can get away with it? Well, Scientology isn't really getting away with it. I mean, they they may still be in business, but they're being sued every day. Uh -huh. um, 
I'm not so sure it's a black and white issue. I don't think they're really getting away with it. I think they they pretend to get away with it. They have a huge number of ex-members that are very vocal. Mm -hmm. With Nexium, I, I think that their attempts at secretism have been successful, and they they're they're intimidating, and a lot of it is because people just normal, regular people don't want to believe cult members. They don't want to believe them. They think they must be weak or stupid or something, and then none of those things are true. Mm -hmm. Cult members are very intelligent, high-functioning people most of the time. They're not seeking anything. They just Mm -hmm. get caught up in a trap. So there's a lot of myths out there that are mm-hmm. perpetuated by the media, mostly. What well, doesn't help, because I've noticed this, that when people leave a cult, their critical thinking is impaired. And they often, because I've, I've watched a lot of people leave next year, and there's a period of time where they're so discombobulated in their thinking that they have a hard time making sense. Right, but that goes away with time. Mm-hmm. It does, it's not permanent. And it, you, it, you would you could say the same thing about anyone. I mean, it's not just Nexium. It's all cults. People have a hard time adjusting after they mm-hmm. leave for for a multitude of reasons. And one is a fear of the out, of the outside world, since they've been told mm-hmm. that they they wouldn't be believed. Mm-hmm. They've been told that they're, you know, they're only safety is in the group, it's kind of hard to overcome that. Now you say that over time, you know, these kind of behavioral limitations disappear. But I have also witnessed certain people who left Nexium decades ago, and they're not that functional. Or they're still deeply, deeply wounded and by the experience in a way that they could never move forward in their life. How does that happen? I think it's a, an attempt to, if they want to hold on to some of the, what they perceive as good experiences in the group, uh, mm-hmm. and they want to hold on to those, but at the same time, they, they want to try to move forward. They're trying to please everyone. Um, and they're having a lot of doubts, and I, I think I think it just it takes time. It takes them becoming involved in something creative and healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't really know a very good answer to your question, except that the only thing that helps is time and good support system and trying to work these things out because a lot of times ex-members think that they're shocking everyone by telling them things. Hmm. So if you can normalize what they're telling you, it, it helps. Mm-hmm. Or, to, or to put what they're telling you in context. And well, what to, remember, is, to remember that the uh, life of an ordinary cult member is pretty boring and frightening at the same time. Mm. And so I sometimes that. people that have left will miss the excitement of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think that anybody really has the, the solution to... It, it's like a traumatic experience. It, it takes a while to to process that. It takes a while to get used to the world again. Mm-hmm. Get used to ordinary relationships again. Is there anything legislatively that could be changed to protect people in a way that they're not being protected now by these deception, deceptive cults? Um, 
I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, because these people are adults. They mm -hmm. are they are allowed to be deluded. Cults are allowed to exist. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't outlaw cults. Mm -hmm. We can't outlaw indoctrination. It's a very subtle process. Mm -hmm. Um, there are laws that are pretty specific about undue influence that mm -hmm. have been in the, the law for 300 years that can be used in certain situations. I know I've used the undue influence legal argument many times, but as far as protecting people go, the only thing we can really do is try to educate people in, in critical thinking. And the problem with that is that most people think critical thinking is criticizing things, when that's not what it means at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good question, and I wish I had a better answer for you, but cults are very common. Mm -hmm. They exist in every single human institution exist in the law, medicine, psychology, therapy, um, non-religious spiritual groups, guru groups. There are cults mm -hmm. within the Roman Catholic Church. There are cults within most religious denominations. Because they, there, there are cults within colleges, higher, you know, I've seen, seen them from every mm -hmm. single possible place, mm -hmm. but we can't pre prevent the cult formation from happening because a lot of it is human nature. A lot of it is explained by human need for power, exploitation of others for money and for sex. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know what we can do that we're not already doing. Okay. Except to have people like you who write courageous books who hopefully will get a wide readership. Because the thing that was good about your book was that it was not just about how you experienced it, but it gave a lot of insight into India's experience, mm -hmm. which most people don't get to hear in most cult-related books, it's about the family complaining about how they've lost their daughter or son and why can't they just wake up and be reasonable. But you didn't have that mm -hmm. aspect. So yours, yours was much better in terms of showing the emotional demands of having a cult member in your family. Mm -hmm. And... You also were very honest about the good and the bad things that you you did. It was a much more honest, so parents could identify to it. So, mm -hmm. so the more books like this to tell an honest story about the struggle, the better. We can just get people to read them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe. We could just, you know pass it out on the airplane or something. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, pass it out at the airport. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, hard being, so I'm constantly being approached with people trying to recruit me into something. Um, <laughs> why don't we just have your book around and say, read this. Oh my God, do you remember in the 80s when Hare Krishna used to be in the airport panel oh, out with yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, they didn't exact they weren't exactly subtle. I mean, it was the thing is, the thing I think my reaction to it was, how could you be right? Um, look at you, how could you be right? It was just because it was so extreme. But, but I know. Most, most cults are not like that. They're, you know, yeah. very much, they're very much out of view, very much, um, but if we could just get people to um, 
read the book. You know, I had I had a, to fly out of the airport a week or so ago, and as I was walking past, I saw your book. I probably passed three bookstores in the airport. I saw your book there, all perfectly stacked up, you know, right there on the mm-hmm. front. And so I was like, okay, people, here it is. <laughs> Pointing to it. I know. It, they've done a brilliant job. It's everywhere. It is the it is. Of getting people to buy it. Yeah. You, you know, I was telling someone the other day that it was even in Costco. Um, wow. They were selling it for ten dollars. Wow! So can't do much more than that. No, they've done everything. Yeah, it's yeah, everywhere. And so get people to read it would be a nice, good step. If I could just get the media to listen, uh, that would be a, a big step. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they sometimes they do a good job. Sometimes they don't. But well, I've, I've done a ton of media. So yeah, you have. A ton. So now it's up to the consumer, because I've done everything that I possibly can. The publisher's done everything they possibly can. And I've never written a book before, so I have no idea how this works. The good news is, is that this story is not going to go out um, of the press for a while, because we've got the trial, we have potential, you know, more superseding indictments and more arrests, and I think it's going to stick around for a while. You know, when the story first broke and I first heard your name, I thought, finally, somebody is, is, somebody is prominent enough to, to bring the story out because I've been dealing with them for so many years. Oh, wow. And it was like, I mean, I was involved in, in legal cases involving this group and I saw lots and lots of evidence and um, like I think I mentioned to you, I read Nancy Saltzman's deposition and I was like, this is just as glaring as it could be, but there was not much I could do except take it one case at a time. What cases were you involved with, may I ask? Sure. You may ask, but they're they're confidential. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sometimes I was just in the background uh, as a consultant, and not not necessarily. Um, but I but I was involved and got to see more than I wanted to. So I've been familiar with this group for a long time. Um, so I was glad to see something happening finally. Mm-hmm. And the thought of Keith Ranieri sitting in jail, I'm sure he's very uncomfortable. And I'm sure it's hard, he's having a hard time adjusting to it. But it's, it's uh, well over time for him. Yeah, I would agree with you entirely. And, and just so you know, it was a very frightening process because um, I was putting myself out there so publicly mm-hmm. and exposing myself with no idea of what, what the outcome was going to be. Right, you showed a lot of courage. Yeah, my daughter said to me the other day, well, <clears throat> that I'd been accused of being just an attention seeker. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> really? Why would you want this kind of attention? <laughs> well, I must be desperate. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of ways to get attention. I mean, uh, yeah. this is certainly not the best way to get attention. No. Yeah. Definitely and not. Well, it's obvious if anybody reads your book that it, it was done out of care for your daughter, so there, that's not really a legitimate criticism. No. And, and people will say what they're going to say, and it, it, it wouldn't stop me anyway, so... Right, and it shouldn't. You're, and you're allowed to tell your story freely, yeah. and um, you have absolutely no obligation to these people to keep their secrets. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was extraordinary, though, because if you think about it, when I started writing the book, 
he hadn't been arrested. Nobody had been arrested. <laughs> right. Writing in the thin air. <laughs> right. And there had been other people that had been, had spoken to the press. I mean, I spoke to the press every every chance I got. I was part of Jim O'Donnell's six-part series. Spoke to the press. He cut out 99% of what I had to say and put in a tiny little bit. Nothing happened. Nothing. That yeah, they went after, except they went after Jim O'Donnell. I know they did. Yeah. And I'm, I've met subsequently with Heidi Hutchinson, who also came out in that series, um, telling the story of how Gina, her sister, had been raped by Keith when she was underage. Mm -hmm. And again, the shock of people coming forward and nothing happening. It was yeah. horrendous. Yeah. It's really, really hard to, and not just this cult, but it's really, really hard to shut down the vast majority of larger successful cults. Some of them have been in operation for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses have been around 150 years. They're still mm -hmm. bigger than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, no one has been able to shut them down, even though there's tons of evidence that they're a corrupt organization. But this is where I'm asking you about the law. I mean, isn't this a failure of our legal system that these types of groups are allowed to continue even though they're, they're like you say, they are criminal enterprises? That's where I'm confused. Well, it's similar to trying to litigate the mafia. I mean, you have to have evidence that certain people are involved in act committing crimes. So, you know, I think in this particular yep. case, in Nexium, they're using the RICO statutes, which is a good, mm -hmm. good step. I'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. But... Well, if you, you know, think about it, in order to fight, sorry, Kathy, but in order to fight the mafia, they have to come up with the RICO Act. Well, it's not just so much the RICO statutes that helped bring down the mafia, but it was the the people that were flipping, people that were coming out and, and testifying at a high enough level that mm -hmm. they could take out major players, but they haven't been able to shut it down completely. That's true. That is so it's, it's still there. It's just mm -hmm. not as flagrant, oh. I suppose, yeah. I think this to be. Yeah, and with the Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, time after time after time, major legal stories have broken about them, and, you know, it doesn't change anything. Mm. They're still recruiting. They're still hugely successful millions of members and so you kind of have to just try to take it one case at a time that's all you can do wow the same thing with Nexium is that mm. I, I think what surprised me in your book was the amount of money they had stashed in their houses you know this sounds like a mafia behavior <laughs> Why would you have a half a million dollars in your house? I don't know, in a shoebox. <laughs> well, and, and behind books and in bookshelves. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand where you think you're going to go uh, without a passport. Then what do you do? I mean, you can go to Mexico, sure, but again, why would you want to be arrested in Mexico? Um. So it's it's really difficult. I mean, and the and the, just thinking about having to get out at a moment's notice, you have to remember where you put all the money. Mm hmm So way too much well, money. Well, way too much money. It shows. In, well, I'm sure they've got millions stashed places. Oh, that's sure. my feeling. Yeah. Well, you know, and that attracts the attention of the Treasury Department and the IRS mm -hmm. and. As soon as you get these people involved, then, you know, it gets a little easier. But, yeah. 
a lot a lot of times ex members are afraid to say anything because they fear retaliation. Yeah. And so in terms of recovery, when you can get them past the phase where they're afraid of retaliation and now they're angry, that's when they're the best and most useful to the case. Mm -hmm. So it takes, it takes time, effort, encouraging them okay. to yeah. speak to you about it, telling them you're not going to be shocked. Yeah. Well, that, that is a given. That's my personality. People can pretty much tell me anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that comes to age. <laughs> so, um, right, yeah. because in your book you said, I'm a mother, I can handle a lot. I remember you saying yeah. that. Yeah. So, but your daughter is going to want to protect you. Mm. So I think you should have the conversation. I don't want you to protect me. You know, when you feel ready, please, please tell me everything. She's starting to. After reading the book, and you like say if whatever you tell me cannot be worse than I imagine. So why don't you just That's tell me everything? Yeah. Sort of giving her yeah. permission, you know, because she's mm -hmm. still protecting you. Mm-hmm. And she saw a lot, you can be sure of that. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. She so how are you handling the book and the, the uh, media attention and all of that? Well, uh, I'm, the good news is, is because I, my background in, you know, entertainment is that I'm fine with media attention that doesn't bother me. The one thing that's hard is that every time I have to go out there and speak about the book, it kind of re-traumatizes me. I think what, I had a sense that writing the book would be closure, and I'd be able to move forward, but it, I'm, re, I'm rehashing details, and it was parts of the book were very painful to write. So that's something that I'm having to deal with, it's, and I'm dealing with it. You know, I've dealt with worse. But that would be the only kind of blip. Right, that'll and that get I know easier over time. That'll yeah. get little, and part of it is I don't know if you're like most people, but they they read the book and they wish they would put something else in, or they wish they would put more about this in. Um, but as but as an expert and an outsider who read your book, it was quite powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I've read hundreds of books on cults. Um, thank you, Kathleen. And I mean, I started reading at 12.01 in the morning. You're amazing. I was so afraid I was going to miss it. <laughs> oh my God, you're probably the first person to read it. <laughs> well, Amazon was great because, you know, you, you put in your pre-request and you wait and you wait and you wait. And I was thinking, well, maybe they'll release it early because sometimes they do that. But no, you know, it has to be on Tuesday. So I just sat up, sat up, and kept refreshing my browser, and finally I was there. I was really, really anxious to see it. Oh, thank you. Because thank I knew so much about this group, I was hoping that, um, you know, I want them to be defeated. I want them to be prosecuted, all of them. Yeah, me too. Do you think there's still, are there still some that you... Uh, think need to be arrested based on your understanding? Oh, many, many. But, you know, I, I, can only, I can only do what I can do, and I can only um, um, try to educate the legal system as much as I can. Uh, a lot of times mm -hmm. lawyers don't want to hear it. Uh, it makes them uncomfortable. They think it's about religion. It's not. Mm. Judges are uncomfortable with it. They think I'm going to get into some kind of a doctrine dispute. I'm not. I'm not going to talk about their beliefs. Um, so it's a lot of fear of based on the First Amendment, which just doesn't yeah. exist. I don't. I don't talk about their beliefs. Mm. Give me ten minutes, and you won't hear me talk mm. about their beliefs. Very interesting. Yeah. That's what the. 
That's what the defense is using as their argument. They yeah, all believe them. Yeah. Right. But they all do that. I mean, because they don't have okay. anything else. Okay. But, but what kind of special belief do you have to have to brand women? That, that's a no belief system I know of. Yeah. That's a practice. Well, and it's mm-hmm. an illegal practice. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, again, remember, lawyers don't really know very much about all this, and they're going to they're going to throw out anything they can, and they they all claim the First Amendment, all of them. Mm-hmm. So you have to have an expert in there that, that doesn't fall into the trap of criticizing them on their beliefs, or number two, diagnosing them or saying they have some kind of a pathology because that's unethical and illegal to, to diagnose someone you've never evaluated. Mm-hmm. And so as long as you can dodge those two things um, and say they have narcissistic qualities, which is different than saying someone is a narcissist. Um, and, you know, as long as you can dodge these two major issues, you should be all right if you stick to practicing. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm very curious to see how this plays out in court, and I think they have a lot more evidence than just a dispute about whether DOS was, you know, an abusive, coercive subgroup or whether it was a self, you know, a female empowerment group. I think that well, it's going to rely less. Well, either of those things. Testimony. It's a criminal organization, and I'm not ashamed yeah. to say it as yeah. loudly as I can. And they have been yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. And their behavior shows that. Yeah. And so, you know, lawyers are going to do what they have to do. Um, Mm -hmm. I also was taken back when I, you know, I was just shocked. I was literally shocked when I saw the name Park Deed show up. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, he's not involved in this, is he? And then I read about it, and first of all, I don't believe that he doesn't know anything about cults. I think he knows Pliny. Mm -hmm. But as a psychiatrist, he's a medical doctor, which means he doesn't use any psychological testing. Um, They're not trained in that. He's a psychiatrist, so he sees things in terms of pathologies or mental illness or mental dysfunction. I mean, it's practically worthless. Yeah. But because he's a psychiatrist, he's a big name psychiatrist, they thought maybe that mm-hmm. would invoke some fear, but you were absolutely right not to cooperate with him. I mean, he shouldn't have even mm-hmm. asked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because, behavior. well, yeah, very bizarre because he must have been paid a lot by Claire Bronfman. Right, but regardless of whether you're paid or not, a lot or not, you still should have ethics. And that, well, that includes not reaching out and and contacting the family of a victim. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know what he, what's, what's going on with him, but um, I, I would like to read more about his opinion of Nexium because he uh, didn't. He didn't have one. He said, "I know nothing about the group." It's I don't believe that. I don't believe it. Yeah. yeah. This is a this is a forensic psychiatrist mm-hmm. that everybody recognizes his name. Yeah. Um, he was just trying to pretend to be objective. Yeah, I was very disappointed. I would never, I would never take money from someone like Keith Ranieri and say, "Oh, I'm going to do an evaluation for you." I would never do that. Mm-hmm. I would never associate myself with cult leaders and take money to help them promote their cause or to justify their action. Mm-hmm. And that's me. I, I'm, I'm not going to assist cult leaders to, to rationalize or justify or normalize. Mm-hmm. You need to call somebody else because I'm not going to help you. Yeah, it's just sick of them. I get a lot of criticism for that. Uh, when I mm-hmm. testify in cases involving cults, where they say, well, you know, you you didn't want to hear their side of it. I said, well, I certainly did. I interviewed their leader. How much more do mm-hmm. I need to hear? 
Mm-hmm. And these are my impressions based on interviewing their leader, but I'm not going to take money to interview their leader. It's just part of the case. I think you, I think you did a very good turn and contributed greatly to the thousands of books we have out there about cults. Um, because I was able to read the whole thing. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, if you feel inclined to, and you may have already um, give me a review on Amazon, that would probably help sure. tremendously. Thank you. Happy to do um, it. Thank you so much. And to anyone else who reads it who likes it, um, that can only help, I think, at this point. Who's sales? Get the word out. Once again, this is Tatiana Prophet with Back to Facts. And as we close this interview between Catherine Oxenberg and Dr. Kathleen Mann, we thank Dr. Mann for her in-depth analysis of how a devoted mother saved her daughter from a dangerous cult. Also discussed were cult dynamics, the struggle to understand what cults are about, and the legal system. A written transcript will soon be available on Dr. Mann's site at cultexpert.net. We thank Catherine Oxenberg and highly recommend her book, Captive, sold at all major book retailers. We urge you to visit and join in on Dr. Mann's social media pages about cults. Dr. Mann can be reached at KathleenMann at gmail.com. And don't forget to connect with Back to Facts on Facebook or go to www.backtofacts.com with the number two between Back and Facts. For media critiques and in-depth contextual articles you can't find anywhere else. And last but not least, we thank the producers at Thinking Agenda for their efforts, editing, and assistance. Visit their site at cultscults.com. That's the word cults, plural, twice, dot com.